Thank you very much. The next item of business is a statement by Michael Matheson on the Draft Infrastructure Investment Plan 2021-22 to 2025-26. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Michael Matheson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm publishing today a draft infrastructure investment plan covering the next five uh, financial years. Uh, this plan delivers our national infrastructure mission. Infrastructure investment touches the lives of every person in Scotland, from the homes we live in and the water, energy and telecommunications that we consume, to how we travel to the places we work, shop and learn. And of course, the schools, hospitals and other facilities from where our vital public services are delivered. As we tackle the harms caused by COVID-19, com compounded by the fast approaching shock of the UK's exit from the European Union, infrastructure has a vital role to play in helping businesses and communities adapt and recover. We are living in genuinely turbulent times and it is essential that government shows leadership and provides as much stability and certainty as we can. The plan offers a robust pipeline of work that will help stimulate a green recovery, offer good green jobs, stimulate supply chains and build market confidence. We launched through this year's programme for government our national mission for jobs. Infrastructure investment and the plan I'm publishing today will be key to its success. In 2018, the First Minister announced the national infrastructure mission, a commitment to overcome historically low levels of UK investment, seeking to reach internationally competitive levels. This mission, may, this mission means that £33 billion pounds of Scottish Government investment in the next five years. It's estimated it will support around 45,000 full-time equivalent jobs across those years. Earlier this year, following broad public engagement, the Infrastructure Commission for Scotland made recommendations about the right future infrastructure priorities, setting a 30-year vision of infrastructure supporting an inclusive net zero carbon economy. This plan responds to the Infrastructure Commission's phase one recommendations and shows how we will implement them in consultation with industry, delivery partners and the people of Scotland. The infrastructure plan I'm publishing today sets out our long-term vision for Scottish infrastructure, supported by three core themes of enabling the transition to net zero and environmental sustainability, boosting inclusive economic growth and building resilient and sustainable places. The plan is closely connected to the recast climate change plan update due to be published in December and recognises the vital role that Scotland's natural environment can play in our infrastructure system. The plan shows how we will enhance our approach to choosing the right future investments and introduces a new infrastructure investment hierarchy, which places an emphasis on maintaining, enhancing and repurposing what we already have. Over time, this will make our public infrastructure investment more sustainable and deliver better long-term outcomes for those who use them. The infrastructure investment plan includes the details of around £24 billion of major projects and national programmes that we can confirm now, with more to be added in future years. This package of investment will give Scotland strong foundations for a wellbeing economy, ensuring society thrives economically, socially and environmentally and that we deliver sustainable and inclusive growth for all. We will strengthen digital connectivity to help us connect, get us connected and improve our learning and business opportunities. We will invest in energy efficiency and low carbon heat solutions to reduce emissions. 
making our homes and our buildings warmer. And we will invest in climate resilience, protecting more homes and businesses from flood risk and adapting to changes at our coast caused by climate change. We will deliver more affordable and social homes, continuing to ensure the right homes in the right place. And we will operate a safe, sustainable, integrated and resilient strategic transport system, providing investment in railways, ports and harbours and our road network. And we will enable community-led regeneration and town centre revitalisation as part of a new place-based investment programme. This will encourage collaborative working, linking and aligning funding initiatives to ensure we have a coherent approach to effectively progress our 20-minute neighbourhood ambition as set out in the programme for government. This is, by its nature, a national infrastructure plan, but it is driven by the needs of our villages, towns and cities, delivering tangible benefits for local communities all over Scotland. In the Highlands and Islands, people told us that wanted our investment to support tourism, improve connectivity and create jobs. That is why we will be investing £30 million in delivering the National Islands Plan and enhancing digital connectivity in rural areas through the REACH 100 programme. In the North East, we are investing £220 million in the Baird and Anchor project in Aberdeen to improve the efficiency of buildings as well as the experience of patients. Across the Central Belt, our investment will target improvements in education, justice, healthcare facilities, including the Edinburgh Cancer Centre, prison facilities and the new National Secure Adolescent Inpatient Service in, in, in Irvine. We will, with partners, support the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland, the redevelopment of the Royal Bot Botanical Gardens and the Mission Clyde Low Carbon Heat Networks. And in the south of Scotland, we are investing in tree nursery capacity, helping to increase carbon storage and biodiversity. And we'll boost economic growth across each region of Scotland, contributing £525 million to city region growth deals, be that in Glasgow, Edinburgh, the Borderlands or Murray. These deals will bring transformational opportunities for inclusive economic growth to those areas, based on local need, creating jobs, improving transport links and digital capacity, enhancing learning environments and increasing housing supply. Sign officer, I have taken the proactive decision to set out these plans now for consultation with the people of Scotland because our economy and our challenges and opportunities require it. However, our final budget envelope for capital investment in future years depends on the outcomes of the forthcoming UK spending review. And I would urge the UK Government to prioritise capital stimulus within its own spending plans. It is my intention to bring together the views we receive through our consultation on the plan, including from local government and other delivery partners with, it to, uh, delivery partners with our confirmed budget settlement. This will enable us to finalise our infrastructure plan and our capital budget allocations. In the interim, the Government is publishing today the Capital Spending Review Framework to complement the infrastructure plan. It sets out high-level planning assumptions which will inform capital allocations over the course of the next five years, whether directly in infrastructure or other areas such as protecting and increasing jobs or through our capitalisation of the Scottish National Investment Bank. The Capital Spending Review and the Infrastructure Investment Plan once finalised, will provide a strong and coherent framework for directing, analysing, shaping and prioritising future commitments, demonstrating how we will deliver on key commitments, value for money and how our funding and finance is matched to our decisions. Officer, while this is a five-year plan, 
It builds the foundations for a stronger Scotland for decades to come. A Scotland that will harness new opportunities and is resilient to future challenges. It will steer the investments that will help our short-term response to COVID-19 and our longer-term recovery. And it will drive innovation, ensure access to growing global markets, create good, sustainable jobs and support a just and fair transition to our net zero emissions and wellbeing economy. Saying officer, I'm consulting on this draft plan to ensure the right final approach that benefits the whole of Scotland, both now and in the future. And on that basis, I commend it to the Parliament today. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question or to press their request to speak button or press R in the chat function now. And I call Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement <coughs> and indeed the draft plan. Uh, obviously, I've not had a great deal of time to pour over the details of it, uh, but at first sight, it looks pretty unambitious uh, and lacking in detail. Now, I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that we do need to invest in infrastructure. We do need to level up the economy. Uh, and so I'm with him on that. And if he wants to consult on this plan, I'm happy to take part in that process and I'm happy to have discussions with him. But can I put it to him that from the last plan, there are things that are yet to be delivered. R100, for example. Uh, I think Fergus Ewing offered to resign over that one. Um, there's no detail uh, in this plan on how we're going to deliver uh, any uh, new ferries over and above the two that still haven't been delivered. Uh, nothing on that. Uh, very little uh, detail on roads projects. It looks to me like the Cabinet Secretary has gone along with the Infrastructure Commission who want to put the brakes on any new road projects. So I think he should probably be apologising to communities across Scotland who are going to be left out by this. When's he going to come, uh, come up with some detail on any of this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Second officer, um, uh, I think the first thing I, I must say is that um, it's pretty clear from the comments that have just been made by Graham Simpson that he has a fundamental misunderstanding of what an infrastructure plan is there to take forward. Let me try and address some of these issues. He states that he says it's uh, unambitious. Actually, uh, this has got the most ambitious level of investment in infrastructure of any part of the UK. And let me explain to him why that is the case. Because in the UK, historically, infrastructure investment has been below that of the average of other comparable nations. And the national infrastructure mission that this infrastructure plan will deliver will actually see a marked increase in infrastructure investment in Scotland to take it to a comparable international level. That will result in almost £1.5 billion of additional investment going into this infrastructure plan on the basis of the figures that we start from in 2017. It is the only, we are the only part of the UK that has given such a commitment because historically the UK government has not met the required levels at an international level. So I can assure the member it's not a case that it's not ambitious. Actually, it's completely the opposite, that it is a very ambitious plan, seeing greater levels of investment into infrastructure. And the member made reference to things from the previous infrastructure plan that have not been delivered as yet and referred to the R100 programme. The R100 programme is in this infrastructure plan. The previous infrastructure plan had the DSSB programme, which not only delivered, it exceeded its target as well, which clearly the member does not have any knowledge of. And in relation to specific programmes as well, as is set out within the actual report itself or the paper itself, it's a range of committed projects. But of course, as I said, this is a, this is a plan that will see some £33 billion of investment over a five-year period, of which £24 billion is committed to and set out within the draft plan as it stands at the moment. Clearly, further projects and developments will be brought forward 
over the coming months and years. So I can assure the member this is an ambitious plan, one that is much more ambitious than that has been demonstrated by his colleagues at Westminster over many, many years. I call Colin Smith. President, officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advance sight of his statement. President, officer, increased infrastructure investment is vital if we are to kickstart our recovery and deliver a just transition to a green economy at a time Scotland faces the deepest recession on record. But too often, this government's track record on delivering major infrastructure projects has been woeful. Three quarters of the projects in the existing infrastructure plan agreed in 2015 have suffered delays and nearly half saw costs rise. Of course, some projects change, but we've seen far too many delays and far too many busted budgets. And some projects have just not been up to standard with tragic circumstances. So could I ask the Cabinet Secretary specifically, how will he ensure this plan does not repeat the ferry fiasco or the sick kids hospital scandal? And how will he guarantee that companies responsible for shoddy construction who are paying out compensation on the one hand are not being handed new construction contracts by this government on the other hand? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, um, uh, let me refer to a couple of the points that Colin Smith has raised. And he's right to say in terms of projects that can be delayed and where costs can actually escalate. Uh, sadly, that's not uncommon for major infrastructure projects. Of course, not all uh, projects come in uh, over budget. For example, the Queen's Ferry Crossing is one, a very good example, which came in under budget um, as well. So there will be projects that come in over budget and others for a variety of different reasons. Clearly, some infrastructure projects are delayed at the present moment as a result of the pandemic which we are experiencing. And at times, it can be due to unforeseen weather events, for example, which impacted on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, or it could be due to particular uh, uh, geological issues when it comes to major uh, building projects. What I can assure the member is that the investment hierarchy which has been set out within the infrastructure investment plan, as was recommended by the uh, Scottish Infrastructure Commission, is one which is based on looking at how we can make better use of our existing assets and how we can enhance them more effectively to make greater use of them. And one of the benefits that comes from that approach is that economically it allows smaller and medium-sized businesses to be engaged in that process rather than just single big projects on their own they are of a smaller capital value that allows smaller localized businesses and smes to be involved in these processes and that's one of the real values i believe which will come from this infrastructure investment plan over the course of the next five years. And as he made reference to the ferries, as the member will be aware, that's a programme that will be taken forward through our ferries plan and is one which we'll make sure continues to ensure we invest in ferries to support our island communities across the country. Call Maureen Watt to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the UK Government announced that there would be no autumn budget. With the financial impact of COVID and the uncertainty of a no-deal Brexit at the end of the year, does the Cabinet Secretary anticipate that this will have an impact on the delivery of the plan? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, I think, first of all, I think uh, the approach has been taken by the UK Government to announce yesterday that there would be no autumn budget without any regard any regard to the economic impact that could have in Scotland and to this Parliament and the Scottish Government's budget is completely disrespectful and completely unacceptable. It just demonstrates ever increasingly the utter disregard that the Conservative Government at Westminster have for devolved parliaments within the UK. And it's actually ill-befitting on the Conservative Party to sit on their hands and tolerate the type of contempt that their colleagues in Westminster are demonstrating to this place and to the people of Scotland by their behaviour. But what I can assure the member is that in the capital spending framework that's been set out by my colleague today, uh, Kate Forbes, it sets out the assumptions on which we are taking forward this investment plan. And those very reasoned, managed assumptions which have been set out would allow us to deliver on our national infrastructure mission increasing infrastructure investment in Scotland to levels much greater than that of other parts of the UK, demonstrating our ambition for the country in order to make sure we get the right type of infrastructure. But we will do that. We'll do that because it's in the best interests of Scotland, despite the actions of a UK government that is systematically seeking to undermine this parliament 
and the settled will of the Scottish people on these matters. Thank you. I'm keen to get all the questioners in, so can I ask for shorter questions and answers, please? Alexander Burnett to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, whilst the headline of doubling road maintenance may be a good soundbite, closer inspection shows this only applies to motorways, trunk roads and the fourth road bridge. So just half an hour ago, the local government minister could offer no support for local authorities such as Aberdeenshire and its critical network of bridges. Can this minister do any better? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, uh, the member will recognise us that the, the doubling of maintenance in our trunk road uh, network is of critical importance to road connectivity in the country. And I'm, I'm surprised, I'm surprised that a member from the North East would be so dismissive of it, given the very substantial transport infrastructure investment that's gone into the North East of Scotland over recent years by this SNP government to make sure that it has a transport system fit for purpose. And what I can assure the member is that we will continue to provide our colleagues and local government with the budget provision that we can allow them to make the decisions that they make on how they want to invest in their local road network. We'll do that despite, despite the continued budget cuts we've had from the UK government over a number of years in order to try to help to protect local government settlements. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. High Speed Rail 2 will deliver faster train travel between London and Manchester Leeds. The cost could be as high as £110 billion, paid for in part by Scottish taxpayers, yet it will provide a competitive advantage to London, the Midlands and the English North. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what discussions have been held with the UK Government to ensure Scotland receives its fair share of taxpayer-funded investment in transport and infrastructure? Cabinet Secretary. Epstein, officer, the member raises a really good point, uh, particularly when it comes to managing major infrastructure projects, when we just have to look at things like Crossrail in London, which is financially, from all we can see, is completely out of control, as is the HS2 uh, project as well, in terms of financial certainty, is, is far from the case. Uh, the impact of that is potentially it has a, an impact on capital allocations across the rest of the UK. I had a discussion with the, uh, the Minister for uh, High Speed, uh, the HS2 project, um, a number of months ago uh, and sought assurances from him on exactly what benefits Scotland would receive in terms of the economic benefits and also spending benefits that would come from the HS2 uh, programme. To date, I'm still waiting for a response to that request. This is the type of approach that the UK government have too often taken, is it's a London-centric approach to infrastructure investment at the cost of other parts of the UK, which is why we as a government in this infrastructure, draft infrastructure plan, is setting out the ambitious plans we have to increase infrastructure spend here in Scotland to try to make sure we drive the environmental and also the economic benefits that can come from such a plan. Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Finney. Capital investment is, of course, helpful in creating jobs, but of equal importance is ensuring that the spending benefits local supply chains and workers on these projects. So what specific action will the Cabinet Secretary take to ensure that spending maximises the benefit to local supply chains and improves terms and conditions for workers? In addition, the investment plan, which is for the next five years, has no mention of the A83, and that will be hugely disappointing to people in my constituency. I am sure the Cabinet Secretary will want to take this opportunity to reassure us and indicate the capital resources will be set aside and in which financial year for the A83. Cabinet Secretary. Fine, so let me deal with the, the last point first. Um, similar to the point I was making to uh, Graeme Simpson in that the infrastructure investment plan doesn't have every single project that will be taken forward over the course of the next five years. It has within it some £24 billion worth of those projects that have been through the process to get to final business case and to go into the infrastructure investment pipeline. Of course, there will be further projects which will be added to that including potentially road projects such as the A83. And I'm sure the member will welcome the very quick action which I've taken in publishing the 11 different options, not waiting till December, doing it in September, ahead of schedule to allow local communities to have a view on what the opportunity is there as an alternative route. Returning to the point that she made on the issue of SMEs and local businesses, one of the real benefits that I think I mentioned to Colin Smith from the infrastructure investment plans uh, investment hierarchy is there's a much greater focus on maintenance projects. So, for example, £1.5 billion of additional maintenance and things like trunk road uh, uh, contracts allows local 
SME businesses to be much more engaged in that process rather than larger capital-based projects that they are unable to compete for. So one of the assessments that have, been undertaken, that have been undertaken in the course of developing this plan is to assess the wider regional economic impact that it could have. And localised maintenance programmes allow us to achieve that much more effectively. So I want to give that member an assurance that's one of the central factors that we have been thinking about in taking forward this plan, how we can help to support local SMEs in some of the capital projects that are taken forward. And the approach we've set out with this investment hierarchy can assist us in achieving that. John Finney to be followed by Willie Remy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, events at the rest and be thankful illustrate the impact of climate breakdown that we're facing. Now, they'll be aware that uh, bridges feature a number of the options for the, the replacement there, but at this stage, they're only road only. There's been some excellent work done by the Cowell Fixed Link Working Group about a ra ra road and rail option, which would not only solve the problem, but also potentially have a significant impact on regeneration of the Cowell Peninsula. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree connectivity doesn't always mean a roads only solution? And will the Cabinet Secretary ensure Cowell Fixed Link Working Group's road rail proposal is given genuine consideration and ensure that scoping and feasibility studies are undertaken? Please. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign Officer, I, I must say to the member that the 11 different options which have been set out for the, uh, as an alternative route for the rest to be thankful are uh, options which have already had some level of assessment work carried out on them. So I'm afraid I can't give that commitment to the, uh, to the uh, Cow Fix Link project which you made reference to, although I am aware of it, but it's not one of the 11 options which we are considering. Can I take, uh, uh, however, can I turn to his, his, uh, his other point, and that is that uh, road is not always the solution uh, when it comes to improving connectivity, uh, uh, and particularly transport connectivity. I agree. Uh, and a very good example of that would be the uh, benefits that we have seen from the uh, Borders Railway uh, and the economic and social benefits that have come from that, which is one of the reasons why I gave a commitment last year to invest £70 million in re-establishing the Leavenmouth line in Fife in order to help to improve not only connectivity but the economic benefits that can come from that as well. So the member makes a good point in that roads are not always a solution and at times there are other options that can help to deliver better connectivity and also better economic, social and envi environmental outcomes. And they're factors that we take into account as part of the investment we're making within the Infrastructure Investment Plan. Willie Rennie to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Uh, what is in the, the plan for yards like Arnish and Methyl so they can compete for offshore wind farm contracts? I'm conscious of state aid rules. But if we are to ensure that the greening of our energy brings jobs too back to Scotland, we must invest in that industrial infrastructure. So what is in the plan for this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I think the member is actually going wider than what the purpose of this plan is in terms of procurement uh, process uh, and uh, uh, processes that we have around that. The member will be aware, though, that there is uh, significant concern about renewable energy investment being constrained and limited as a result of the approach which Ofgem and the UK government are taking with the contract for a difference and also the way in which the regulator is interpreting the way in which investments can be made. I've made representation to the UK government on this. We need to see Bayes taking action in order to allow greater levels of investment in renewable energy, both onshore and offshore, to be taken forward if we are to achieve our climate change ambition of net zero by 2045 and the economic benefits that we can get from that here in Scotland. And my colleague Paul Wheelhouse has a meeting just next week with Ofgem to address a number of these very specific issues that we need to see regulatory change around in order to help to support the industry here in Scotland and across the rest of the UK. So I think the procurement issue goes wider than this particular plan, but what I can assure a member uh, of is the wider issue that he raises around the issues around renewables and the impact that some of the regulatory function has in uh, the way in which uh, developments can be taken forward are issues that we are very alive to and pressing the UK government for urgent action on. Ruth Maguire to be followed by Edward Mountain. 
presiding officer, infrastructure investment done well will help our communities thrive economically, socially and environmentally. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what measures are included in the infrastructure plan to tackle inequalities and economic exclusion in Ayrshire, please? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, President Officer, the member raises a, raise a very good issue. Alongside the uh, draft plan, I'm also publishing uh, Equity and Fair uh, Federal Scotland Duty uh, interim statement, uh, which uh, members can consider because uh, tackling inequality is one of the central parts that's contained within the infrastructure investment plan and a number of the strategic projects which will be supported over the course of the next five years. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, already set out a very ambitious plans for continued investment in housing uh, in order to make sure that we have another increasing level of social housing being available uh, and the plan helps to support that over the course of the next five years. The member will also be aware that uh, in the very near future we will have the 2040 uh, housing plan which will be brought forward by my colleague Aileen Campbell and Kevin Stewart which again will set out our ambition to make sure uh, that everyone uh, who requires to have access to decent housing uh, within Scotland are able uh, to do so. But also the wider economic benefits that can come from uh, creating greater employment within, uh, within uh, uh, the Scottish economy help to make sure that we support people to get into employment in order to tackle poverty and to make sure that we provide good quality green jobs uh, during this particularly challenging time uh, post as we move through the pandemic and uh, beyond from it uh, and recovering from it. And finally, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the Highlands, we're quite used to being left behind in infrastructure delivery. On page 42 of the plan, it mentions the Highland Prison that actually was promised to be built in 2016. Uh, it said in the plan that it should be completed by 2026. Why won't it be concluded by 2026, Minister Cabinet? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the member will be aware that we've made very significant investment in our uh, uh, criminal justice estate over an extended period of uh, time. And it's interesting when the member talks about um, the lack of investment in the Highlands, he chooses not to mention the new yeah, justice centre which has been created at Inverness, which I had the privilege of breaking the ground of when I was justice secretary, seeing a state-of-the-art facility being provided in the Highlands for uh, the use within the criminal justice system. And of course, as we go forward with our capital investment programme, we'll be able to look at what further programmes can be introduced into that and other facilities that can be introduced as a result of that. What would it aid us greatly in being able to achieve some of that is if we could have clear line of sight of the UK government's capital spending review, which I understand has been delayed yet again, yet again, uh, with no line of sight being given to the Scottish Government. But what we will do is we will go on doing the best job we can, as is set out within this plan, a very ambitious plan. And what we will do is we'll make sure we continue to invest in Scotland's infrastructure in a way that serves the people of Scotland well now and into the future. Um, my apologies to those members I was uh, not able to call. Clearly it proves the equation that longer questions and longer answers mean fewer questions and fewer answers. We now, though, have to move.